5. Wilhelm Gustloff On January 30, 1945, a German ocean liner was torpedoed by a Soviet submarine and sank in the icy Baltic Sea, killing almost 9,000 people. The Gustloff, named after a Nazi leader who was assassinated in Switzerland back in 1936, was built as a cruise ship for the Nazis, Kraft Dug Freud, Strength Through Joy program, which offered recreational opportunities to average working-class German citizens. In 1937, Hitler launched the 680-foot-long, 25,000-ton vessel. The Gustloff was first used by the German military as a hospital and then as a U-boat training facility after World War II first broke out in 1939. Operation Hannibal, a massive evacuation of German military personnel and civilians, was launched by the Nazis in January 1945 as the Soviet army moved closer to East Prussia. As part of Operation Hannibal, the Gustloff sailed from Godenhafen in East Prussia to Kiel, Germany on January 30th. The Soviet submarine S-13 quickly saw the Gustloff and fired three torpedoes at it. The German liner went down in just 90 minutes, about 12 nautical miles off Stoltbank near Poland. The Gustloff disaster is one of the deadliest maritime disasters in history because, according to current estimates, only about 1,000 of the believed 10,000 people aboard survived. For many reasons, the world learned little about the history of this disaster. The Nazi regime suppressed news of the sinking and censored survivors from spreading the story. A few remained silent because they felt guilty about their German heritage and the war crimes carried out by Nazi Germany against millions of innocent people. 4. The Sultana The Sultana caught on fire in the Mississippi River during the early hours of April 27, 1865, just days after the Civil War ended. It was a 260-foot-long wooden steamboat built in Cincinnati in 1863 and frequently took passengers and cargo between St. Louis and New Orleans. The ship docked in Vicksburg on April 23, 1865 to tackle boiler problems that had come up during a routine trip from New Orleans. While in the harbor, the U.S. government procured it to transport former Union prisoners of war from Confederate prisons like Andersonville and Cahaba back into Northern Territory. The Sultana's captain, J. Cass Mason, decided to patch the leaky boiler instead of making a more extensive and time-consuming repair in order to fulfill the lucrative contract. Union Army Captain George Williams, who oversaw the whole operation, hastily ordered that all former prisoners at the parole camp and hospital in Vicksburg be quickly transported on the Sultana out of fears his colleagues were taking bribes to transport prisoners on other boats. Despite being designed to carry only 376 people, the steamboat was packed with over 2,000 Union troops, over five times its legal hauling ability. Williams insisted the men travel on one ship, despite objections from several officers who felt the ship would be overloaded if the men were divided. Although the Sultana was steaming up the Mississippi heading north, the severe crowding and fast-moving river current brought on by the spring thaw increased pressure on its recently repaired boilers. On April 27th, shortly after leaving Memphis, Tennessee, the overworked boilers exploded, destroying the center of the vessel and igniting an unmanageable fire. Those who weren't immediately killed by the sharks later died trying to swim to safety. About 200 of the initial survivors were killed as a result of burns suffered during the blow. The Sultana incident is one of the deadliest maritime disasters in American history, according to research, as 1,195 of the 2,200 passengers and crew were killed. 3. MV Dona Paz the Philippines flagged passenger ferry Dona Paz set sail from Tacloban, Late Island, for Manila, with a stop in Catbalogan, Samar, during the morning of December 20, 1987. Sadly, the ferry collided with oil tanker MT Vector at Dumali Point along the Tabla Strait at 10.30 p.m., while most passengers were fast asleep. The Dona Paz was carrying 1,041 tons of gasoline and other petroleum products. The tanker's combustible cargo and the collision ignited a fire that spread quickly on board Dona Paz. After the incident, survivors remembered hearing the crash and seeing the initial explosion, which shook the whole ship and caused panic. There were no lights on board thanks to a blackout, and there were also no life jackets anywhere to be found. With no guidance from the worried crew, passengers had to decide whether to stay on board the burning ship or jump into the flaming waters. It took only two hours for Dona Paz and four hours for the Vector to sink under the murky waters of the Tabla Strait. A total of 26 people were saved, including 24 from the Dona Paz and two crew members from the 13-person crew of the Vector, despite the fact that they were not listed on the ship's actual manifest and 
and an estimated 4,386 people died in the terrible catastrophe. The majority of these survivors were burned after jumping into the fiery waters. The entire crew of the Donna Paz were killed. The death toll of 4,386 people is still the highest ever recorded in a single maritime incident during peacetime. A series of safety violations led to this fatal incident. The owners of Vector were held responsible in 1999 by the Supreme Court of the Philippines because the ship was investigated and found to be unseaworthy. The boat was also operating without a permit, a lookout, or even a qualified shipmaster. Even though it was the deadliest shipping incident in Philippine history, the sinking of the Dona Paz is only one of the many disasters in the Philippines' extensive maritime history. Notably, there have been 53 shipboard fires, 177 sinkings, and over 80 collisions in the country's waters from 1972 to 1987 alone when the Donna Paz accident happened. The company who owned the Donna Paz was specifically involved in a total of four deadly ship accidents, which were responsible for the deaths of over 5,000 people in just 11 years. Only 10 months later, in October 1988, the sister ship of the Donna Paz, the Donna Marilyn, sank off the coast of Leyte Province, killing about 300 people. Ten years later, in September 1998, the ferry Princess of the Orient, which happened to be the sister ship of Donna Paz and Donna Marilyn, sank itself in the stormy seas near Cavite and Batangas, killing close to 200. And another ten years would pass thankfully without an accident, until June 2008, when the Princess of Stars sank 1.8 kilometers from Siboyan Island, killing roughly 800. The ship, which was previously owned by the same company and operated under the name Don Sulpicio, experienced a significant fire in 1979 and was proclaimed a constructive loss. The vessel, however, was renovated and re-entered service as the Donna Paz 2.0. The ship was 24 years old when the accident occurred. Even though the marine investigation and the court decision found that the owner of the Donna Paz was not responsible for the tragedy, the overall body of evidence indicates the company had a history of having a subpar safety culture. The company's CPC was suspended seven years ago in 2015. It now goes by a different name, offering far fewer cargo services. 2. The White Ship Disaster William Adlin was the grandson of the infamous William the Conqueror and heir to the thrones of England and Normandy. He passed away on November 25, 1120, at a young age of 17. After setting sail for England, his ship, dubbed the famous White Ship, collided with a giant rock and sank, drowning nearly everyone on board in the chilly waters. This tragedy, which caused the death of the throne's heir, propelled England into a terrible civil war known to historians as the Anarchy. The young man bore the name of his ferocious grandfather, and despite being described by one chronicler as a prince so pampered that he would be destined to be food for the fire, he managed to rule England for about a year before his death, with the help of his able advisors. He married Matilda of Anjou in 1119, securing the boundaries of King Henry's possessions in a strong royal union, despite the fact that the child he married was only eight years old at the time. He also seemed like he'd be the ideal heir. With so much riding on this young man, his spoiled upbringing seemed understandable in a time when children died very easily. The distress his passing caused also highlights how crucial it was to have a secure line of succession in place back in medieval Europe. As Normandy was considered to be the French's possession, William was made the honorary Duke of Normandy and in 1120 was required to honor his feudal lord from this land, the King of France himself. King Henry, William's father, was supposed to go as the land's owner, but because he hated the idea of bowing down to any monarch other than himself, he persuaded Louis VI to accept his son's loyalty in his place. After completing this task, William rode back north to meet his father in Barfleur, a Norman port town in the northwest region of France. Henry had made plans to sail home on his own, but Thomas Fitzstephen, a local captain, made William an offer he just couldn't refuse. In a show of royal continuity, Fitzstephen's father, Stephen Fitzgerald, who'd commanded the ship that transported William the Conqueror across the seas, approached the Conqueror's grandson and offered to sail him across the English Channel. Fitzstephen also had a brand new ship that was being refitted that was well known along the coast of the English Channel for its graceful elegance and speed. William and his entourage were ready and willing to be associated with such a glamorous offer and ride aboard the La Blanche Nef, or the White Ship. William's party drank copious supplies of French wine as they boarded, and after much enthusiasm, they started to give the drink out to the crew as well, while Henry sailed ahead on his own royal ship. 
Some passengers disembarked at this point after some fun. What followed was sadly so easy to predict. After witnessing the king's ship leave, the inebriated men on board yelled at Fitzstephen to push the ship and reach England first, and the captain, who had complete confidence in the speed of his lovely vessel, gladly accepted the challenge. It is unknown exactly how much alcohol he consumed at this point. As they hurried out of Barfleur, the crew prioritized speed over safety, paying little attention to the hazardous rocks surrounding the point at Gatville, where there's now a famous lighthouse to prevent modern shipping from making the same fateful mistake. Fitzstephen brought the ship dangerously close to the shore. As a result, it abruptly struck the Quilboeuf, a submerged hidden rock, and started to sink into the icy water. Panic sparked as the passengers attempted to reach safety, but only a few sober bodyguards remained calm enough to guarantee William made it onto a smaller lifeboat. William was able to grab his half-sister Matilda, who was on board at the time, but when he did, it gave enough time for a group of frantic men to scramble onto the small lifeboat with them. It sank as a result of the weight, killing everyone on board. According to one writer, Fitzstephen survived and made it to the surface, but after learning about William's fate, he chose to plunge back down and take his life instead of facing the wrath of the intimidating and grieving King Henry. The king is said to have never smiled again after receiving the tragic news. Henry ruled for 15 more years and remarried. His first wife, also named Matilda, passed away in 1118 in an attempt to sire another heir. The union created no children, leaving him with only one daughter from his first marriage. His daughter, named after her mother, was very skillful, and after getting married to the Holy Roman Emperor Henry V, she was given the official royal title of Empress. With her benevolent personality and family name, Henry had no reservations about publicly announcing her as his heir but his misogynistic, power-hungry barons had some other plans. No woman had ever held the throne of England, and Geoffrey of Anjou, Matilda's second husband, was widely hated due to his reputation as a rival. When Henry died in 1135, his nephew, Stephen of Blois, dethroned Matilda, throwing the kingdom into an upheaval and chaos. The barons crowned Stephen as the king, prompting Matilda and Geoffrey to invade Normandy in 1139 to reclaim the throne. This also played a big part in the harsh civil war known as the Anarchy, though some of the time referred to it as the Shipwreck. A modern historian, William of Malmesbury wrote, No ship that ever sailed brought England such disaster, and the consequences of the White Ship disaster were lengthy, as history reads. 1. The Mont Blanc On December 6, 1917, the Mont Blanc, a French ship loaded full of explosives and bound for Europe, where World War I was raging at the time, collided with the Emo, which was sailing to New York to pick up supplies for war-torn Belgium. The Mont Blanc caught on fire after the collision and soon came to rest on the Halifax waterfront, where a crowd had gathered to watch it burn down. A significant explosion was caused about 20 minutes after the collision, when the fire ignited the 2,925 tons of explosives the Mont Blanc was carrying. The impact of the blast was so powerful that physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, known as the father of the atomic bomb, later studied it to determine the possible damage the nuclear weapons he was working on might be capable of. The explosion instantly killed dozens of people nearby and devastated the surrounding region, collapsing buildings, setting entire neighborhoods on fire, and even causing a tsunami in the waters. The tragedy was made worse by the fact that a blizzard hit the area that night, which ended up slowing rescue and relief efforts. The Halifax explosion, the deadliest man-made explosion until the first atomic bomb dropped on Japan in 1945, left more than 2,000 people dead, more than 6,000 injured, and about 9,000 people without a home. Thanks for watching. Which one of these disasters do you believe could have been avoided? Tell us in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.